What's crack, big dogs? Welcome bite to the channel. Welcome bite to the headquarters. My name is Nicholas, and I tried to hold off for as long as I possibly could to talk about all this free agency madness. You know, I wanted to wait until Deshaun Watson signed with Atlanta, which is going to be renamed as Watlanta once that fucking deal closes. But we'll make an entire video on it, celebrating, popping champagne, doing all that fun shit. A lot of stuff has happened, though, outside of Deshaun Watson. And we're going to cover it all as it relates to fantasy football. So I don't give a fuck about defensive players. You know, we're here to talk about the quarterbacks, the running backs, the wide receivers, the tight ends. And as more players land, I'm assuming we're going to hear a Deshaun Watson decision within the next, you know, 24 hours, 48 hours. And then once Watson signs with Atlanta, then that's when Jarvis Landry, Allen Robinson, Will Fuller, Leonard Fournette all sign with Atlanta too. So we'll just make one big Atlanta video. Maybe I'll fly down to Atlanta to make the video. I'll go into the dome. We'll get some Chick-fil-A. We'll call it a fucking day. How's that sound? Are we ready? I'm fucking ready. As you can see, I'm very caffeinated. <sighs> Let's tuck our shirts in. Stop yelling. Let's drink caffeine. <laughs> dedicate this entire first section to the Jacksonville Jaguars, okay? Because they've made a lot of shmoney moves over the last 72 hours, over the last week or so since free agency ripped open. Now, I, I respect what the Jaguars are doing from a team building standpoint right now. It's, they have the right vision. They have the right theory, right? It's like very much like Josh Allen. It's like what they're trying to do with Daniel Jones. They're trying to do with Zach Wilson. It's like you get your quarterback. You have the guy that you believe in that you think is going to take the franchise over for the next five to 10 years and you build around him. However, the tools that they're asking him to build with are, are very, you know, are very questionable. It's almost like Trevor, we, we drafted you, right? We drafted you in order to build our family a big house that we can all live in. Here are the tools that we're going to give you in order to build that house. Here's a screwdriver. Here's three nails. Here's a piece of plywood. Here's some spaghetti for dinner. Here's uh, a dead plant. And here's a TV with a fat back to it. That's kind of like what they're asking him to do here. I guess they it's it's the only thing they can do, right? Like they, they're, they're not a, a lot of great wide receivers on the free agent market. They're doing what they can and they're throwing a lot of money at whatever they can which led to the Christian Kirk signing, okay? So they let DJ Chark walk, obviously, to Detroit, which we'll cover in a little bit. And then they gave Christian Kirk absolutely outrageous money. It was like 40 years, 72 million. I think, you know, it's it's kind of, you, you hear a lot of these signings and you're like, oh, this is ridiculous. How does he get that much money? Most of the times, these contracts are not actually what they show to be on the surface. Like Von Miller's is like six years, 120. More often than not, when you hear one of those types of monster fucking haymaker contracts. A lot of the time, you, you don't even count like the the last three years of the contract because that's when there's like a uh, a dead cap to cap hit type formula where it's like you're saving $30 million if you cut this guy after this year. They, they know going into it, right? Both sides know that like, okay, I'm getting my money in the first three years. I'm probably going to get cut or traded after the third year. So I'm not seeing half the money in this fucking contract anyway. So don't get caught up in all the numbers unless you are using these websites like Track or whatever to actually see behind the curtain, right? We're peeling behind the curtain to see that it's, one, it's St. Patty's Day. Well, for you guys, yesterday was St. Patty's Day. But the only fucking green that these Christian Kirk likes are seeing is shmoney, all right? And he's seen a lot of it. So he was signed basically to be, I mean, you don't give someone that kind of money unless he's the projected wide receiver one for your offense, at least for the time being. He's coming off, I guess, probably his best year, 77 catches, 982 yards in 17 games. He is just 25. So that's uh, that's the big thing here, man. They also brought in Zay Jones, who had, I mean, quietly a big year for Las Vegas. Uh, it was his pretty much best year. I would say it's all fucking relative to Zay Jones having a big year. Because I think he finished with like 550 receiving yards. He did have a couple big games down the stretch where it was like, okay, maybe he could take over a game every now and then. That's that's useful in, in the NFL when you're only playing 16, 17 games. Like, you have a wide receiver take over for two of those games. It's you know big fucking chunk of your season. So, signed Zay Jones. Three years, $24 million. They went out and grabbed 
Evan Ingram, you know, which I'm I'm pretty somber about because I was a big Dan Arnold guy going into the year, but that pretty much knocks him off the table. I think like this Ingram signing is a little bit intriguing because Trevor Lawrence targeted his tight end so heavily last year, but like Evan Ingram is the least intriguing person. Like we are yet, he's been in the league for five years. We're yet to know if he's actually good at football, which if you have to ask that question probably means he is not. Here's what I know. Here's what I don't know, actually. Here's what I know and what I don't know. The Jacksonville Jaguars... I don't know if they have any good football players in terms of pass catchers. Like, I don't know if any of the pass catchers or signings are actually good at football. But I'll tell you what, they have a lot of really athletic players that are going to be getting a lot of exercise next year. All right. Ingram, Christian Kirk, Zay Jones, top tier athletes, man. That doesn't always mean production on the football field. All right. In all seriousness, though, I, I like this for Kirk a lot. It's hard to imagine the fantasy outlooks very differently from the way we were thinking about it last year, right? We we're going in and no one really knew who to draft there. It was like, was it DJ Chark? Was it uh, Marvin Jones? Was it LaVisca Chenault? And we correctly predicted Marvin Jones to be the best value man. St. Patty's Day, I forgot how nuts it gets here in the city. It's 11 a.m. and there's fucking hordes of frats going around the city, absolutely vandalizing the place. And I can't wait to join them as soon as I finish filming this. Where the fuck was I? Christian Kirk's probably going to play the slot. That's where he does his best work. That's where he's probably the most productive. And it's pretty clear that they don't see Visca being the slot guy for them in the future. This oh, this entire free agent thing was terrible for LaVisca Chanel. He was easily the, the biggest loser here. Uh, I don't even know if he's going to be a starting wide receiver for the Jags. I would like to see them at least give him a chance one more year. But it's going to be Kirk. Marvin Jones is still there. And then, I mean, you sign Zay Jones probably to be a starter or at least split time which I think this means like at best LaVisca Chenault is a part-time player that maybe sees a little bit heavier of a snap load than a guy like Zay Jones but there's been some rumors and reports of LaVisca Chenault possibly being in the trade market and I think he'd garner a lot of a lot of interest I'd like to see it you know fucking uh, LaVisca why be the wide receiver four for Trevor Lawrence when you could be the wide receiver four for Deshaun Watson you know what I'm saying we bring back Julio A-Rob Will Fuller fuck it Calvin Ridley let's fight for him in court get him bike next year did we just did we just put together the best team in the NFL? I think we did. I think we did. Road to the Super Bowl goes through Watlanta. Don't fucking forget it. Okay. Trade rumors. Uh LaVisca, I'd imagine he gets a lot of trade interest if that were true, because he's young. He's very athletic. Um, he hasn't really been given a shot yet to exceed. So a lot of coaches out there are gonna be like, I could be the guy that fucking does it, right? Because that's how they operate. They think they're the fucking chosen ones out there. Um, but let's assume LaVisca stays. What does this mean for anybody? Again, it, I, this is a pass catching group that I will, without a doubt, be staying away from unless you're getting like Kirk in the 11th, 12th round. Then I could shoot my shot at it. But this is going to be a, a merry-go-round, a carousel fucking playing. Uh, what's, that, what's that fucking game where you're trying to catch the frog that pops his head out or whatever? That's basically what all these wide receivers are going to be. Uh, they did get Brandon Sheriff, which is a big, big underrated signing. Three years, $52 million. Shores up the offensive line a little bit. Any help they can get on the O-line is really, really, really big. But end of the day, this is probably a win for Kirk because at least he gets more opportunity than he did in Arizona, most likely. It's a win for Trevor Lawrence because at least they're trying to put some fucking weapons around him. Um, but the only guy I will probably be drafting much of in 2022 is Travis Etienne. All right. And with that, let's move over to the running bike position. And uh, we can talk about the Miami Dolphins backfield. So got excited about Chase Edmonds for about 45 seconds. And then they signed 45-year-old Raheem Mostert. So Chase Edmonds signs with Miami two years, I think $12.5 million. I thought that that was going to give him the shot to be like the workhorse and the starter, right? Because all they got there is like Miles Gaskin. I think uh, Malcolm Brown, Philip Lindsay, Duke Johnson are all free agents now. So unless they want to resign one of them, but I doubt that happens. They've got the new head coach, Mike McDaniel, coming in who runs, who, you know, who at least was a part of a very successful running offense there in San Francisco. But he did, again, sign Raheem Mostert, which tells you that he loved him in San Francisco. And Raheem Mostert was an awesome fucking player when he can stay healthy. He came out and basically said that Mostert's going to have a similar role to what he had in San Fran, which means basically the early down guy in the zone offense, RPO offense type thing. Uh, so that kind of really hurts the value of both of these guys. I think they're both going to be – Chase Edmonds, I think, is kind of relinquished to like a third down back type weapon uh, sort of guy. We'll get some early down carries, but I think Raheem Mostert is probably going to be the first and second down guy for as long as he could stay healthy. So do I love it for Mostert? Like, not really. The Niners were a much better situation, better coach, better offense, better line. So this is going to be a committee in an offense that's probably going to be in the bottom half of the NFL. So 
you don't know who's going to get the goal line work. Um, you don't know what Chase Edmonds' role is. So both of these guys, like Mostert's probably going to settle in as like a eighth round redraft pick, and Chase Edmonds, uh, Chase Edmonds probably not too far behind. But the signing of Mostert is really, really, really unsexy for both of these guys in this backfield. So we hate to see it for Miami. But you know what is sexy? These fucking glasses. These glasses make me look way, way sexier, way more sophisticated. I tweeted this out the other day. I asked a girl out. And she said that she would go out with me if I wore my glasses to the date. And you guys had no one had told me that I look way better with glasses. I mean, I don't really look good either way, but I guess there's a little bit of a boost when I have glasses on. Um, and I have Felix Gray to thank for that because I wear these Felix Gray for, you know, it's like it's it's the opposite of the NFT world right now. NFT is all art, right? Like people want to buy it for the art and like that's eh, collectible like that. That would be like if these glasses made me good looking, but they have utility behind them in that. It protects me from the fucking blue light coming off these screens all the time, right? That's what Felix Gray is known for. That is their main focus is being a blue light blocking brand of glasses, okay? They're definitely in the luxury part of it. As you can see, most blue light blocking glasses, I need to clean these off a little bit. Most blue light blockers have like orange lenses, right? So they look funky and like you look like a fucking cyborg. You don't want to wear that shit out in public. But these, you could only wear them out in public. You wear them out on dates. You're going to do fucking better on dates when you wear them there, apparently. That's what the fucking rumors are saying. Watlanta, baby. Sorry, getting fucking riled up on a motherfucking Thursday afternoon. Felix Gray, these glasses are one of the best purchases I've made on $100. If you're someone that like looks at screens all night, uh, you're in bed watching TV, you're in bed fucking script flipping through TikTok. I heard a crazy stat today. I was listening to a podcast. So TikTok overtook Google as the single biggest platform in terms of hits. So overall, um, just hits like going onto the platform, going onto the website. TikTok overtook Google for the first time ever. The average amount of time spent on TikTok is an hour and 15 minutes, which is unbelievably impressive given the fact that most TikToks are like 30 seconds long. That is just, you guys need to fucking get a life, all right? Sorry. Let's talk Felix Gray because these are the thing, these things help me sleep. I'm not good at sleeping, but these things are one of the key things that does help me sleep when I can fucking sleep, all right? So if you're someone that looks at screens all day, I have 65 screens in front of me right now, these will be the most helpful things that you could buy, all right? If you have bad sleep, if you're looking at your phone, if you're one of those assholes on TikTok until midnight or 1 p.m. or 1 a.m., 1 p.m., all, all hours of the day, these Felix Gray glasses will be the reason why you can sleep and why you're healthier and why your eyes are not strained at all hours of the day. So go check out Felix Gray. The link to take you there will be in the description. If you go through that link and you buy something there, you're obviously supporting the brand. We love Felix Gray. We don't love Mitchell Trubisky in Pittsburgh. I mean, for all the hype that was going around Mitchell Trubisky, man, he lands two-year, $14.5 million contract. That That's literally Chase Edmonds' money. That's literally running back by committee in a Miami Dolphins offense money. So he lands in Pittsburgh. There's no uh, guarantee that he's a starter next year. He'll compete with Mason Rudolph. I still think this very much leaves them in the running to draft a quarterback this year, Kenny Pickett or someone like that. So this just felt like... You know, they took an opportunity where they saw one. You know, there's probably never a bad time to just grab another reliable quarterback, whether he's a backup or not. Now they'll have a competition there. And maybe one of the guys, maybe it makes them compete a little bit harder, right? And one of those guys blows the other guy away, and then you have a better starter than you would have had otherwise. I hate this for the weapons. I hate this for Deontay Johnson. He's going to be moving down my board. I just don't like it for anybody there. Mr. Trubisky is so fucking inaccurate. Everyone's like, oh, he looked good in like the fucking four seconds he played last year. Like, we have a big sample size of him being terrible, him being really inaccurate. Like, he could be a fun fantasy quarterback because he's mobile and he's athletic, but he's not a good passer, all right? Don't get it twisted. Don't don't forget what Mitch Trubisky was. That's a shite fucking passer, all right? So Mitch Trubisky, two years in Pittsburgh, does not have the job locked up by any stretch of the imagination. James Conner does, however, though. He resigns three years, $21 million in Arizona. He becomes the workhorse uh, really hurts my Eno Benjamin propaganda. I guess Chase Edmonds leaving leaves the door open for Eno to carve out a role. But James Conner should very, very firmly be in the RB1 conversation for next year. Huge win because, one, Chase Edmonds leaves. Two, we've already seen what they want to do with James Conner. This is a very good offense. This is an offense that lends itself to a fucking guy like James Conner scoring 18 touchdowns where the goal line opportunities are mwah, fruitful. So it doesn't really look like Cliff Kingsbury is any indication of changing what their offense was in terms of the opportunities James Conner had. He finishes the RB5 in fantasy. All right, so you're going to be able to get James Conner right now. I believe his underdog ADP is probably like RB15 or RB17 or something like that. So if you can get the delta between the two, I absolutely love that. In season-long leagues, 
I think one of the best moves this year will be taking James Conner and then handcuffing him with Eno Benjamin late in your drafts. Okay, so you're going to get the discount of where James Conner is getting RB5 type touchdown opportunities. And obviously he's dealt with injuries throughout the, you know, throughout his career or whatever. But James Conner is going to have the same role. Like there's no reason that he won't have the same role he did last year. And this was my argument against Chase Edmonds going into last year was that like we have a three year sample size of Cliff working with Chase Edmonds and never giving him the workhorse role. And it was an easy fade for me because Cliff's pretty like fucking straightforward with how he's going to use guys, especially in the backfield, man. We know if he's got a guy that he likes the running back position, like it's systems go. And that guy is uh, that guy is James Conner. Um, I'm not going to pretend like his finish last year was on the on the bike bone of 18 touchdowns, of course. But again, that's what you get when you're in Arizona's offense, man. A crazy stat I found the other day, too, was like I was looking at James Conner. You know, I, I was like trying to get a feed or trying to get a take on how I feel about Conner. I'm like, you know, what? there's still some hesitancy for me. And I'm trying to figure out where it comes from. And naturally, it was very, very easy to find. For, for someone who finishes a top five fantasy running back, this blew my mind. He finished with 752 rushing yards last year. That was 27th in the NFL. Like, I don't think we've ever seen a disparity like that where a top five fantasy running back, it's hard to imagine any top five fantasy running back finished with fewer than like 950 rushing yards. 27th in the NFL for James Conner. But again, I think uh, he'll get way more opportunity this year. Hopefully he can stay healthy. Obviously, you know, he missed some time, so there was some games that he didn't rack up those rushing yards but I think the move is take James Conner at a discount you're getting an RB1 and then you know Benjamin Hancock if he gets hurt let's continue down Amari Cooper goes to the Cleveland Browns so I I mean listen I this is just one of those guys I don't think you need to waste your time arguing about when it comes to fantasy football next year it's just a guy who you're going to draft as like a low-end wide receiver too and that's exactly what he's going to give you okay you're going to draft him as like wide receiver 22 and then you're going to argue that his ceiling is like wide receiver 18 and it, it at the end of the day it doesn't fucking matter the difference between wide receiver 18 19 and wide receiver 24 in terms of like fantasy points per game or his floor of like wide receiver 26 is fucking negligible it doesn't matter right and you're gonna say oh that's like a lazy take blah 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 but it's like the longer you play fantasy football and the more you understand about stuff like this you'll realize that that takes the correct take his ceiling is not that high in this offense at the end of the day it's an offense that continuously ranks high in rush attempts they don't trust their quarterback they're not taking a lot of shots downfield there's just not a lot of ceiling like yes he can finish this year with 130 135 maybe even 140 targets but they're not going to be valuable targets and i doubt he finishes that high volume because this is such a run first offense all right he'll be the clear wide receiver one there in an offense that you just like don't really love to have pass catchers in so amari cooper's like i'm not he's not a total fade for me by any stretch of the imagination if i can draft him as wide receiver 23 or something and he can finish as wide receiver 21 that's great but like let's not get all fucking hot and bothered about it like his bike up for the last few years michael gallup signs with the cowboys five years 62 and a half milli huge dub for gallup owners in dynasty that's what I fucking thought. Browns notified they're out of the running on Deshaun Watson. It's fucking eat it, animal. I come in here and saying the, it's the it's the Falcons. He goes, nah, it's Cleveland. Fucking moron. Anti sharp butter knife. Fucking soft ass pillow having mother. So with Cooper gone, right? Cooper had uh, a run in in Dallas that was really significant in terms of a role, right? He he saw over a hundred targets in all four seasons that he was in Dallas, and if you average it out on a per game basis, his normal season average was one hundred and eighteen targets per year okay that's major opportunity for a guy like Gallup who they clearly really 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 strong like Cedric Wilson is also gone he signs in Miami it's a ton of faith in Gallup who is coming off a torn ACL that happened in week 17 of last year that is I know we're getting spoiled with how quickly these guys come back from injuries but like week 17 is pushing it bro like we'll we'll have to wait throughout the offseason to get reports on like how the injury updates are coming with Gallup he he just turned 26 years old so he's not he's definitely not old but he's definitely not like really young anymore, right? Like I feel like I would have expected a contract like this if Gallup was like 24, 24 and a half years old, but he's 26. So this is, you know, just just one that kind of speaks volumes about the confidence that the Dallas Cowboys have in Michael Gallup. I mean, he's got a really, really strong profile, obviously. We know he's got the size. We know he's got the speed. He's able to separate man coverage, outside press coverage, whatever it is. Right now, I, I think we'll, we'll see something where you know, maybe he starts on the pup list. If he doesn't, he'll probably get out of the gate a little bit slow, less than 100% there in Dallas. But he's someone that can have some really, really strong games and be like a wide receiver three 
down the stretch for you. So I think you draft him as a wide receiver three, knowing that the first quarter or the first half of the season is going to be a little bit of a down game. But in that offense, man, this is a situation in Dallas that's ranked top five in pace, that's ranked top 10 in pass rate ever since Kellen Moore has taken over as a coordinator. And as we see Zeke get fatter and less effective on the ground, we're going to see more and more opportunities through the air. So Gallup's a guy that you know going into it, you're probably drafting with a slow start in mind, but a really, really strong finish down thy stretch. DJ Chark, I don't know if we're getting a strong finish or start from this guy. He goes to Detroit one year, $10 million. You know, it's not, it's not great. It's not great, fam. You know, when you are, uh, you're coming off your 25 year old season as a young athletic wide receiver and you get a one year prove it deal that tells me something has gone horribly wrong. That's it, man. You're, you're, you got a guy coming off of, uh, a bad year, a couple bad years in a row, injury plagued, whatever, and he goes to a bad offense that we have no idea who, you know, could be Jared Goff throwing him the ball, could be a rookie throwing him the ball this off or this upcoming season. If anything, I, I'm happy with that for Amon Rob St. Brown because I don't want to say this puts him out of the running to take a wide receiver early on and, like, put the pressure on for Amon Ra to be the wide receiver one there, but it definitely pulls back the reins a little bit, right? I think they have the two and maybe like the 27, 28 or something like that. And that could absolutely be range for like Traylon Burks or one of those guys. And you know what? The the one year deal with DJ Chark is more of a prove it deal. So I don't say it pushes them out of the range to take a wide receiver there, but you know, I'm just fucking trying to make things up uh, as we go here. But I, I have zero in here. End of the end of the day, my take is I'm drafting Amon Ross St. Brown exactly where I was prior to the signing, and I have no interest in drafting DJ Chark on the Detroit Lions. J.D. McKissick's move was going to be one of the most interesting moves of the offseason because it, one, fucks the Buffalo backfield. Two, it would have unleashed Antonio Gibson. So he agreed to terms of Buffalo and then pulled bike on it and then agreed to come and play for Washington again. And then there was rumors that, like, he might not be signing with Washington. So I don't know what the fuck J.D. McKissick is doing right now, all right? Whatever it is, he needs to stop drinking. I think he's going to be back in Washington, which means we're getting another year of pissed-off Antonio Gibson owners. This will be, if Gibson's going in the second round, I'm not drafting him. If McKissick is there, uh, if McKissick was gone, I'd be all in on Gibson as, like, an early second-round pick or something like that. But it looks like McKissick's going to be back. And as we know, that will lead to a lot of targets going towards him and not towards Gibson. Though I do think they'll get him a little bit more involved in the passing game this year, Gibson. Uh, I still think Gibson is very much just like Joe Mixon, where he's going to need a very high volume of touches and you know receptions and carries in order to be like really, really efficient. And Mixon was awesome this year in fantasy because he got a lot of goal line opportunities, right? But he still didn't get like a ton of receptions. And I think I think they're very similar players in that like a lot of their carries, the far majority of their touches are going to be like three yard fucking carries into a cloud of dust. And I'm way more confident now in the Cincinnati Bengals than I am in Washington with Antonio Gibson. And then you mix in J.D. McKissick. And this is a killer for Gibson right now. If something changes there, then obviously Gibson skyrockets up the rankings. But we will cover that when it happens. Um, I can't believe we didn't start off with this. But Tom Brady is fucking bike. My guy unretires. I don't even know what to make of this. I mean, it's it's really unsurprising. Like, I tweeted out, you know, by Tom Brady and Dynasty, like, the day after he retired, or maybe the day of his retirement. I was, like, only half kidding. I, like, really wasn't kidding. Because, listen, when you... I understand why people retire when they get older. Because when you get older, your talent diminishes. His talent didn't fucking diminish. So he's going to be sitting there, seeing all these moves happen, seeing people playing football, seeing all the activities in the offseason, and say to himself, like, I am still capable of being better than all of these guys. And that's where the itch is going to kill someone like Tom Brady. If he knew his talent was diminishing, he had a really bad year last year, and he saw these other guys playing, he wouldn't be saying to himself, like, I'm still better than all these guys. I could still play and compete at a high level. Therefore, he would never come back. But he still can, which is probably why he came back. And we're going to be waiting for Chris Godwin to come back. He signs the extension, which is huge if you're a dynasty owner. I have no idea how long Tom Brady's going to be playing for. Did he say this is his last year? Definitely not. Like, he could end up playing for another three fucking years. Who knows? But Godwin, huge dub. They signed Russell Gage. Three years, $30 million. I mean, you could say it's Godwin insurance, but they also need a wide receiver three in this offense. Uh, and you don't really sign people for, like, $30 million if you're just needing them for, like, five weeks in the beginning of the season to take over for Godwin. This could be a situation where we see Godwin play a little bit more on the outside, which could be exciting because it means more downfield shots because we don't see a lot of those with Godwin. A lot of the time last year would be like 10 catches for 100 yards. So it's always like these quick slot slants, and you love that in PPR. But it'd be nice to see Godwin rack up a few Mike Evans receptions every now and then. So I like the Russell Gage signing. It's not anything I'm going to go crazy over, uh, but he'll probably be like a, a wide receiver four or something, that, a guy that I would be not actively you know, fading when, when you're paired with the GOAT, Tom Brady. I think it's a, a nice little signing. One thing I will note with the Bucks, though, so they re-signed Ryan Jensen. They lost Alex Kappa, Ali Parmet, Mar, Ali Marpet. Sorry, there's been a lot of names I've been saying so far. Ali Marpet did retire, but 
they grab Shaq Mason from the Patriots. I'm not even going to begin to try to explain what happened here because I don't know. Shaq Mason was so good last year. He's one of like the best guards in the entire league, and they just let him. There has to be something to the story that, that I don't know or that we don't know. If anyone has any insight on why Shaq Mason just went for nothing, please comment down below. That would be wonderful. Uh, also, thumbs up while you're down there and subscribe to the channel if you're new. So I don't know what's going to happen with the offensive line. They started losing pieces, but then they got some pieces back. So, you know, I'm not really going to comment on it. It is what it is, you know. So we'll have to see what Gronk, Lenny, and Ronald Jones are doing. Mike Evans is probably a f the, one of the better values in fantasy right now because if Godwin ends up missing time, if he starts, like, his ACL tower is very late in the season as well. So if he starts on the pup list or something, the first month or six weeks of Mike Evans' 2022 season, he might see 15 targets a game. He might see, like, 15 targets a game. So Brady's bike. And he's right there in like the QB six to seven fantasy range, in my humble ass opinion. Uh, Zach Ertz resigns with the Cardinals. I love this. So Christian Kirk is gone. Chase Edmonds is gone. AJ Green's going to be gone. I love Zach Ertz for fantasy. Okay, he falls into that tier of like second uh, tight ends for me. Right? You have you have the the top guys, the elite guys, the Kelseys, the Wallers, the Kittles, the Kyle Pitts this year. Then you have like a, a little smorgasbord of of guys that are in the second tier that are extremely usable, right? You have Zach Ertz, you have Dawson Knox, you have TJ Hawkinson, you have Dallas Goddard, you have Dalton Schultz. We're all going to be really strong players for you in the tight end realm. And I would say Zach Ertz probably has less upside than all those guys. So if you looked at the other guys I named, like Knox, Goddard, Hawkinson, Schultz, if you told me at the end of the year, any of those guys was like top three to four fantasy tight end, probably wouldn't bat an eye. I'd be like, oh, really? But also like, fucking no like not surprising Ertz I would be so I think he's got less upside but I'd be shocked if he falls out of the top 10 fantasy tight ends he, he was really good with Arizona man he showed a like a, a game that he hasn't been able to show in years like he he looked like a fucking dead skeleton when he played uh in Philly like it was literally just catch the ball and 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 your fucking controller immediately unplugs when he caught the ball there in Philly but in Arizona he had some spark in his game he had some juice in his game now you have a lot of these weapons leaving Arizona and that opens up a pretty big void for for Ertz to average you know seven eight targets a game that's big numbers for fantasy Tight ends. What else do we got? Um, some uh, there's some underwhelming signing, like some underwhelming that that fantasy Twitter will tell you matter slot signings. Isaiah McKenzie gets like 45 bucks to resign with the Bills. Braxton Barrios resigns with the Jets, but like Corey Day, yeah, like those things don't fucking matter. Who did I miss? Ricky Seals Jones signs to the Giants, who don't have any tight ends under contract, so he's you know kind of under the radar athletic guy who showed some some glimpses last year when uh, Logan Thomas was gone. So I don't I don't really hate. Uh, Ricky Seals Jones, OJ Howard signs with the Bills. That's a nice little depth piece right there, athletic depth piece. All right, uh, I think that's everybody. I think we are caught up. We still have a lot of wide receivers uh, to be signed in Atlanta. Again, like I said, Jarvis, Fuller, Robinson, uh, Julio, Deshaun Watson, obviously. So we'll cover those guys probably in a video next week or if it happens over the weekend, maybe I'll get to it. Go to Felix Gray. Go to fucking Felix Gray. FelixGray.com, link down below, and I'll love you for that. All right, thumbs up button. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. Go eat some fucking green donuts.